Hi, I'm Vlad, and today's topic, circular motion. How far can you kick a football? Well, let's imagine that we live in a flat world with no air resistance. If we kick the ball, well, it will probably go somewhere here. Due to gravity, it eventually falls onto the ground and stops due to friction. What if you kick the ball harder? Well, it will of course go further. What if you don't kick it, but you use a small cannon? The ball goes even further. And the bigger the cannon, the further the ball goes, but it always reaches the ground. But, but the earth is not flat. The earth is round. Christopher Columbus proved that in 1419 something and we still believe him. So the earth is round and the harder you kick the ball the longer it travels and the further it goes. At some point if you kick the ball hard enough it can reach the southern hemisphere. What if you use a humongous cannon and kick the ball so hard that it actually returns to the initial position? It makes a complete circle around the Earth and returns to the point of start. Well, the necessary speed for this is around 8 km per second or higher. In this case, the ball returns with the same speed, so it has the energy to make one more circle, and then again, and then again, we say the ball is in orbit. Satellites work like this. You start a satellite, it reaches the speed of 8 km per second, and then it continues going round and around the Earth, well, virtually forever. Of course, satellites do fall due to small amounts of friction, but theoretically they can do this forever. This type of motion is called uniform circular motion. It has two main characteristics. First, the speed of motion is constant, and second, the orbit is an ideal circle. There are also two important physical quantities connected with uniform circular motion, and these are period and frequency. Period is the number of seconds needed to do one complete revolution, and frequency is the number of revolutions per second. Period and frequency are reciprocals, so period is 1 over frequency, and frequency is 1 over period. We can say that the ball that we kicked earlier is performing uniform circular motion. So the speed is constant. But if the speed is constant, can we say that the acceleration of the ball is zero? Well, actually, no. If you look carefully, the speed of the ball here has a direction to the right. Here, downwards. Left, up. So the direction is always changing. And if the direction is changing, it means that the velocity is changing. And if the velocity is changing, that means that there is acceleration. In fact, the ball is accelerating with an acceleration which is called centripetal acceleration. And this centripetal acceleration is equal to v squared divided by r, where v is the speed of the ball and r is the radius of the circle. From Newton's second law we know that acceleration can be only caused by a force. Well, in this case the ball is traveling around the earth so gravity is pulling the ball towards the center. So, the centripetal force is equal by Newton's second law, is mass times acceleration. So it's mv squared divided by r, and this is a centri 
feet on fours. Uh, what is this force? Well, actually, it's not a real force. It's just a resultant of other forces. In this case, it is the gravity. So gravity provides the centripetal force. We will see this in later examples. Why do we need a centripetal force? Well, according to Newton's first law, if there was no force, the body would move in a straight line. Let's say this mass on a rope. If I start spinning, I provide a centripetal force. Where does it come from? Where, what is the origin? Well, the centripetal force is the tension in the rope. So I can say that the tension in the rope is equal to mv squared divided by r, where m is the mass of this thing, v is the speed, and r is the radius, or the length of the rope. In this example, if I stop applying a force, that is, if I let go, the ball will move in a straight line. An example. A car is traveling over a curved bridge. We need to find the reaction force from the bridge on the car. So, the data is given. 900 kilograms, 20 meters per second. Radius of the bridge is 60 meters. First of all, let's imagine if, if the car is standing still. Well, there are two forces. The weight of the car and the normal reaction. Since there are no other forces and the car is not moving, therefore not accelerating, these two forces are equal. So the normal reaction is equal to weight, and weight is easy to calculate, 9,000 newtons. So if at rest, 9,000 newtons. Let's remember this result. Now, the car is moving and it is moving in a circular path, so it's performing uniform circular motion. In this case, we know that the car is accelerating and the acceleration is downwards. Therefore, there must be a centripetal force acting downwards. But where is it? We have weight, we have normal reaction, where is centripetal force? Centripetal force is the resultant of these two. So, centripetal force is equal to weight, mg, minus normal reaction. So, normal reaction is equal to mg minus centripetal force. Centripetal force is mv squared divided by the radius. So, normal reaction is mg 900 multiplied by 10, well, g is 10 in this case, uh, minus um, 900 mv squared divided by r. 900 times 20 squared divided by 60, which gives us 3000 newtons. This is an important result. Remember, when the car was stationary, the reaction force was 9000 newtons, and when the car is moving, it's 3000 newtons, so it's three times less. In fact, the curved shape of the bridge reduces the impact of the car on the bridge. So it reduces the force with which the car acts on the bridge and the bridge acts on the car. Imagine a similar situation with the same data, but now the bridge is convex. Now, look, in this case, the centripetal force has an upwards direction. So, centripetal force is now, in fact, normal reaction minus mg. So, normal reaction, if we rearrange this formula, is mg plus centripetal force, plus mv squared divided by r. If we calculate this, it gives us 9000 plus 6,000, which is, in fact, 15,000 newtons. 
So if we were to build a convex bridge, that would in fact increase the impact of the car on the bridge. And that's why we don't have convex bridges for cars. Bridges are usually concave, like this. And finally, a very simple example with which about 90% of students keep struggling. Although the answer is pretty simple. Imagine you're sitting in a bus. This is you. And this is the bus. The bus makes a really sharp left turn. Do you feel a resultant force? And what is the direction of the resultant force that you feel? People tend to answer that they feel a resultant force to the right because they feel that their body is moving to the right as the bus turns left. Now this is an incorrect explanation. In fact, you feel a resultant force to the left and this resultant force is provided by the seat and by the window on the right of you because it pushes you to the left and you feel this push from the right and that's why you think that you are being pushed to the right where in fact the window is pushing you to the left making you move in circles because when you when the bus turns you also turn and to move in circles you need a centripetal force which in this case is provided by the window of the bus if there was no window you would continue moving in a straight line and the bus would turn left another common misconception is when people start to use the term centrifugal force forget about it there's no centrifugal force well not until you go into university and you choose physics as your major. Until then, centrifugal does not exist for you. Thank you. Goodbye.